All right, welcome everyone to No Neuro Anatomy. My name is Sarah Nolan, and I'll be moderating along with Emily Duggan today. So we're pleased that you could all join us for our seven week series um, and No Neuro Anatomy mini series that brings you lectures from experts in the field covering different neuroanatomy topics each week. This series was created by trainees and early career neuropsychologists to provide free high quality didactic experiences. We'd also like to recognize the No Neuroanatomy Planning Group for their work in making volume two of this mini series. We would like to thank our sponsors for their financial support of the series. Before we start, we wanna make sure you're aware of the YouTube channel, every No Neuropsychology as well as the No Neuroanatomy series are available for your viewing pleasure. Be sure to check it out, subscribe, and like our lectures. Here are disclaimers for the series. This training is not meant to replace formal education in neuropsychology, and the views of the speakers are their own. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A box at the lower left of your screen, and a recording of today's lecture will be provided on our website and YouTube channel later this week. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Christine Mullen for today's lecture on sensory pathways. Dr. Christine Mullen completed her Doctor of Psychology at Mercer University. She completed her clinical postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Utah School of Medicine, where she is currently a staff neuropsychologist in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. And she serves as the Assistant Training Director of the Neuropsychology Postdoctoral Fellowship. She conducts neuropsychological evaluations in outpatient and inpatient settings, specializing in traumatic and acquired brain injury, stroke, and solid organ transplant. She also provides cognitive rehabilitation services. She currently serves as a board member for the Brain Injury Alliance of Utah and is an active member of the INS Membership Engagement Committee and the NAN Education Committee. Her research interests include TBI patient outcomes, the efficacy of cognitive rehabilitation, and the ecological validity of executive function measures. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Mullen. Go ahead and take it away. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a true pleasure to be here today and be able to get, have the opportunity to present to you all. And so I'm just going to share my screen and please let me know, Sarah, if there are any issues with that. It looks like we're looking at the presenter view at the moment. Okay, now okay. we're up to, I think we're in the middle of the slides, but I'm not the first one. Oh, it worked just before. I know. <laughs> All right, let's try that again. There we go. First slide. Awesome. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. All right, so for the broad topic of sensory pathways, I could spend an entire four hours talking about all of the different areas. So I figured I would narrow it down to be more consistent with the population that I serve. And so that's primarily, like uh, Sarah said, with um, considerations of traumatic brain injury, acquired brain injury, and stroke. And so for that purpose, I chose to focus on the auditory and vestibular system. So I'll be presenting specifically in those areas. And for disclosures, I do not have any funding or anything related for ongoing studies in any of these areas. Um, for today's objectives, I'll be reviewing the different pathways, and then I'll also be discussing some different common presentations that we can see in the clinic with some different um, considerations of conditions. And then I'll get into the, some nuances of how this can present within um, concussion symptoms. And also I'll be going over a case example. I know it sounds like a lot to achieve, but I'm positive we can power through it. And so to start off with, I have a few trivia questions to set the stage to be more enjoyable. So for the first question, um, which one do you all think would be more likely to cause permanent hearing damage? A um, rock concert with Metallica and yours truly from Stranger Things? Uh, would, or would it be a gunshot, chainsaw, or a subway train? Want to get your answers, lock them in. And then for our next trivia question, what is the efficacy of the transmission of sound 
to the inner ear? Is it 60%, 30%, 80%, or 100%? And we'll be going over some details to hopefully get you to the correct answer. And then for this one, how many nerves are in the human cochlear nerve? Is it 100,000, 30,000, 650,000, or 1 million? Last one, the cochlear nerve fire, uh, fibers receive their input from how many inner ear uh, hair, uh, hair cells? Is it 30, 500, 1, or 120? So to cruise right along into the content. So for the auditory and vestibular systems, obviously we have the cranial nerve involvement of cranial nerve eight. And so that's a vestibular cochlear nerve. And that concerns of the special somatic sensory, which also can include the other sensory organs of the olfaction, vision, as well as the hearing vestibular. However, cranial nerve eight, only passes through the brainstem in comparison to the other special somatic sensory um, pathways. And for uh, uh, auditory and vestibular function, they're peripherally very similar. And there is, however, they respond to different uh, stimuli types. And for just breaking it down a little bit further, we're gonna go through um, the cochlear nerve first with a vestibular off branch second. All right, so for hearing, the ear is broken down to three different components. So the first is the outer middle, uh, the outer ear that consists of uh, the pinna, as well as the ear canal that comes all the way down to the eardrum. Oh, you're not seeing my, um, are you all able? I'm just going to do the laser pointer. Here we are. So we have uh, the pinna going down for the ear canal all the way to the eardrum. And then we have the middle ear, both the outer and middle ear are uh, have air. There's no liquid in there whatsoever. And so when we talk about like pressure within the area, it's within those two areas. And that's why we have the eustachian tube that helps clear out any pressure changes that you might experience within different altitudes. And within the middle ear as well, we have um, the ossicles they're broken down to the um, malus, stapes, as well as the incus down here. And those um, go directly and hit onto the oval window, which is on the inner ear. And within the inner ear, uh, that's located within the bony labyrinth of the temporal bone. And that also houses the semicircular canals, which is involved in the vestibular function that connect to the vestibular nerve. And that gives rise to the cochlea, which is, um, is responsible for the auditory processes and is connected to the auditory nerve. And, and so within the middle ear, I know this seems a, a little bit overwhelming, so we're just going to go step by step. We're going to be focusing on the lower portion here. And so, like I said, this is extending from the uh, outer ear and it comes into the middle ear. And so we see the tympatic uh, membrane, same as the eardrum, which then connects to these ossicles. So we have um, the malus, which is also known as the hammer that innervates into the incus, the, which is also known as the anvil. And then it connects to the stapes, which is also known as the stirrup. So you can see how that function, one connects the other and ends up into going into the oval window. But importantly, this mechanical uh, transduction of the sound waves is really important for hearing since it allows for the intensity of the sound waves to be modified before it goes into the inner ear. And so there are two muscles specifically that dampen the amount of vibration that could be uh, transduced from the tympatic membrane into the inner ear and stabilize the ossicles and prevent them from vibrating too robustly. And so you can see here the uh, tensor tympani muscle over here, it goes in control and it's innervated by the trigeminal nerve five. 
and that helps um, support the um, malice, whereas you can't see the other one, but there's another muscle that innervates for the stapes, and that's uh, innervated by the facial nerve seven. So that will come up again for thinking about presentations um, for different symptom complaints for individuals. And so with the flow that we see here with the sound enters into the tympatic membrane, activates on the ossicles, and then um, puts force onto the oval window and, and it goes into the cochlea. And so what we see here for the cochlea, there are three different portions of the cochlea. We have the um, scalar vestibuli. So that is, um, has um, paralymph. And what that is, is just, it's a type of liquid flow. And so we have the innervation um, for the flow of the liquid going all the way through for both the uh, vestibuli as well as the tympani portion of the cochlea. And the way that this works is that the stapes um, pushes the flow onto the liquid and it comes all the way around the circle until all the way to the end of the vestibule, and then it goes into the reverse order all the way back through and back into the round window. So it has that um, it has any leftover fluid and um, vibrations over and dumps into the round window. And the middle portion of the is the cochlear duct. So that has a different type of liquid in it. It's a bit thicker and it's uh, more similar to uh, like extracellular fluids and has a slightly different ionic uh, composition. And so for that it has the hair cells inside and we can see a, a larger breakdown of what that looks like over here. So for the cochlear duct, we can see that it has both the uh, different scala vestibuli as well as the uh, scala tympani. And so we have that pressure and the vibration going within the cochlea that acts onto the cochlear duct. And for that, it also can, uh, puts pressure directly onto the basilar membrane that innervates these specialized uh, neuroepithelial receptor cells that's against the tentorial um, membrane. And with those vibrations, they oscillate and activate these different specialized hair cells and it activates on the spiral ganglion that goes and attaches to the cochlear nerve. So I know that's a lot of information, but we could see on the next slide, it's a little bit more easily broken down. So... Here we could see the activation of the external auditory stimulus onto the tympatic membrane with that's the ossicles activating onto the oval window that causes that liquid to vibrate. And then um, depending on where throughout um, how high of the frequency the sound is, it goes all the way through and comes back and turns into that round window for that deposit. Importantly, um, with the, the position and how far these um, activation goes, you have the, it's, um, Sorry, the sound is actually um, organized in a way that the lower frequencies are, are at the farther ends, we're at the higher frequencies in a different position. And so with that, we can, let me go back one slide because I think it actually shows it better. And so we can see the lower frequencies are at the farthest end of the cochlea, whereas the higher frequencies are closer to the um, oval window. So thinking about the fluctuation of the liquid um, being activated, if it's a lower frequency, it's gonna be activated more um, centrally within the cochlea. And then, so thinking about here with the cochlea, you could see through this lateral view that the uh, vestibular cochlear nerve exits the brainstem at the um, pontum medullary junction, just lateral of that facial nerve. 
And so that region is called the um, cerebellopontine angle. And why that's important, again, think about localization of these different nerve endings and the different presentations that individuals can present with complaints about. And so if we look at this innervation, we can see with the cochlea, the spiral ganglion cells are connecting in, um, in two different locations. And so the first is looking at that dorsal cochlear nucleus. And we could see that it passes dorsally, hence its name, um, to the inferior uh, cerebellar peduncle, and then cross that pontine um, tegmentum area and ascends contralaterally to the uh, lateral uh, uh, lemniscus. We could see that um, both of these radiate to this area, but for this one specifically, then it, it goes up all the way up to the um, branchium of the inferior colliculus. Then you can see that has multiple decussations. And so it's really important for thinking about where you can localize any type of um, hearing difficulties. In comparison, we see that we have the ventral cochlear and nucleus. And for this one, it passes ventral, again, hence its name, to the inferior uh, colliculus in two different directions. We can see it goes up bilaterally up to the juncture of the superior olivary uh, nuclear complex, again, going up through these different areas of the inferior colliculus, all the way up to the inferior colliculus uh, decussates, and then up through the medial geniculate nucleus. And so thinking about like the different uh, difficulties that patients can present with, with different hearing difficulties, this area here, the superior ovulary nuclear complex, um, if there's any type of difficulties there, they can experience issues with localizing sounds and horizontal space. And we'll get more into the peripheral um, presentation of auditory complaints in just a bit. And so for this piece, we can see that it's, it has both efferent and efferent, but for this one, I feel like it gives a better um, picture of what this looks like on a smaller scale. So we could see that um, how the hearing innervates into the pons and up through the um, auditory cortex. And so for the inferior colliculi, it, go, it branches up and ascends through the medial geniculate nucleus, as we can see here, and then it goes up to the acoustic area of the temporal cortex, as well as the medial, um, through the medial geniculate nucleus. And for the auditory radiations for the primary auditory cortex, that's termed Herschel's transverse gyrus. And we could see here that also, um, as we saw in the cochlea, that is uh, specific to the different frequency and tones that is also mapped out similarly within uh, Herschel's area. And so the ascending pathways, thalamus, uh, to the auditory cortex contain a relatively greater contribution of the contralateral ear and damage the auditory pathway at any level of rostral to the cochlear nuclei causes problems with localizing sound and separating sounds from background noises. And I, that's a common problem that a lot of people um, complain of, especially with concussions. And then for these efferent aut auditory processes, um, we see that the descending pathways travel from the auditory cortex down through the medial geniculate body and through the thalamus and going through the inferior uh, colliculi and the uh, accessory auditory nuclei of the brainstem to terminate in the caudal structures of the pathway. And so why this is really important because this system helps control those ossicles that we were talking about earlier. And so if there is um, really loud noise or it's anticipating to have louder noises, it's going to be able to control those ossicles um, and send information to help um, dampen the noise back all the way up 
to the afferent uh, nerve fibers so it can um, help control the um, uh, mechanical oscillation onto the inner ear of the cochlea. And so with my mouse wants to behave with me. So talking about hearing loss. And so there's, it's broken down into two different components. So we have the um, sensor, I'm gonna, and uh, sensory uh, neuronal is broken down into two components. So we have sensory, which is more of the hair cell dysfunction that begins at the basal end of the cochlea, or we have more of the neural. So that's going to be more of the nerve cell atrophy. And with that piece, you can ha have um, deficit in speech discrimination. Whereas for conductive cue loss, you have more of the abnormalities in the external auditory canal or within the middle ear. And for um, assessment of these, you can do um, either air conduction testing or you can also do bone conduction testing. And I have links in here for the neuro exam that's available for free to test these out. Um, and for the bone conduction, the tone on is quieter on the affected side, whereas it's louder on the affected side for the air conduction for the conductive uh, hearing loss. And so there are several causes for each of these, but importantly, as we saw for the um, pathways for auditory processing, that it decussates multiple, multiple times and throughout the brain and so it's you it's rare that you will see um, unilateral um, loss due to any type of uh, cortical involvement so unilateral lesions um, reduced in hearing because of the present like with having auditory neglect when you have that bilateral simultaneous stimulation and so with the Typically when you have the cortical deafness presentation, you're going to have uh, damage to both bilateral damage within the auditory cortex um, for, and that innervates through the different pathways all the way down. It's not gonna be just on one area for the lesion. So um, another thing that is important to think about is about more of the peripheral hearing loss. And so that's going to be um, going to be in those structures that are more um, peripheral. And so in going back to these trivia questions, if you chose a, a gunshot, you would be correct. And the reason why that is, is when we were talking about the muscles that can track and control those ossicles, it's what happens is that if you're in a rock concert and enjoy Metallica, your ears are going to be priming itself for those louder sounds. And so what it does is it controls those ossicles to not uh, vibrate as intensely. And so then it prepares you for um, those louder sounds. And so therefore, they're not going to be as likely to have uh, permanent um, loss of hearing. However, of course, as we can see here on this chart, the louder the decibels that we hear, you know, the more likely that you are going to have some difficulties. And specifically within these louder uh, decibels, anything that's over about 90, and so we're looking at uh, just above the subway train, if you have if you're exposed to that for longer periods of time and more frequently, then you're gonna have the increased um, potential of having that permanent hearing loss. And so what is the efficiency of the transmission of the sound to the inner ear? So that's, going, if you chose 60%, you would be correct. So when we're talking about the ossicles activating on the oval window, you're having at least that 60% um, change. And that's because with air, obviously that moves more easily than fluid. And so when you have that activation onto the fluid of the cochlea, then it tends to slow down. So you don't get as much um, efficiency. And so for how many fibers are in the human uh, cochlear nerve? It's 
actually only 30,000. And thinking about um, the optic nerve that has over a million different um, axons, you know, this is pretty darn efficient. So 90 to 95% of all cochlear uh, nerve fibers receive their entire input from how many cells? If you chose one, you would be correct. So that uh, single inner ear hair cell typically synapses onto about 10 different auditory afferent cells. And so again, we're seeing that this is very, very economical in comparison to the visual and olfactory systems. And so moving on to vestibular, this is very important for adjustment for posture, muscle tone, and eye position in response to movements of the head and space. And it's really important because it also has intimate connections with the cerebellum as well as the spinal cord, brain stem, uh, motor, and extraocular system. So it has a lot of different plays with different um, systems. And so it's very, very complex. Uh, and so another trivia question. What is the hardest bone of the body? Is it metatarsal, temporal bone, femur, or the orbital? What do you think on that? And as I was saying, there's a lot of different um, pathways that um, correspond to vestibular function. So it's all about location, location, location. And so as we could see here, this is more of a superior view of the internal auditory canal as well as the inner ear structures. So we could see here that we have the temporal bone here that en encases the, um, the different uh, semicircular canals are involved in the vestibular function. And then you can also see how you have the innervation of the facial nerve as well as the cochlear nerve and the superior inferior vestibular nerves. So there's a lot going on in a very, very small place and a lot of interaction between these different systems. And so now we're gonna be focusing more on the top portion here. And so the, um, as we saw for the bony labyrinth of the uh, temporal bone that's encasing this uh, bony labyrinth. And what that is, is it basically houses these different um, semicircular canals. And so with the bony labyrinth in circles, the uh, membrous labyrinth. And so with those, basically the membrous labyrinth is floating in liquid within the bony labyrinth. So specifically the bony labyrinth is filled with um, paralymph that communicates with uh, of the, the duct over here. And then we also have the uh, membrous labyrinth that has the endo um, lymphatic duct that communicates um, and dumps through these different areas. And so with um, these different semi-circular uh, angular uh, canals, each of them are positioned uh, specifically to be within the motion in which they're detecting. Meaning when we see this lateral, it's detecting horizontal. And then when we have these two structures, they're uh, detecting position and acceleration within those two uh, axes of movement. So with the angular uh, acceleration of any type of a rotation of the head causes movement of the endolymph through the ampulla. So down here, we see that if there's angular movement in a direction, the endolymph is going to flow in the opposite direction through the ampulla, which is located over here. And then so with that, we could see it um, the flow activates on the um, cupula, onto the cilia, and then onto the hair cells. And all of those interact onto the crista ampullaris. And so with all of those movements, then it finally activates all the way down to the axons onto the vestibular ganglion. And for the vestibule, those are broken down in two pieces here. As we can see, it's the utricle and the saccule. 
And for these, it's broken down over onto this area, the macule that is located inside those areas. And for here, we could see that it contains uh, structures um, that have the calcified crystals called the otoliths. And then we have the gelatinous uh, layer that has the hair cells within. And then of course, with the activation, it uh, terminates within the axons of the vestibular ganglion to project onto um, the vestibular pathways. But importantly, these act differently. I'll get into that in just a few slides. So um, specifically with the gelatinous layer, that's more looking at gravity and linear acceleration or pulling on those crystals to have that movement for detecting uh, linear changes. And so specifically, we could see that we have two different uh, portions of the vestibular ganglion for this uh, cranial nerve eight. So we have the uh, undergal as well as the lateral uh, semicircular uh, canal and the anterior semicircular canal as well as the anterior saccule. Those are innervating onto the superior where we see the posterior semicircular um, canal as well as the um, posterior saccule projecting onto the inferior ganglion. I know it's a lot, it's a ton, but I promise I only have a few more specifics about this process. And so when we're detecting head movement, I, I thought this would be a really good side to demonstrate this rotational force. So if you are rotating in one direction, like I said before, you have the endolymph motion going into the opposite direction. And when you have that impact onto the um, cupola, you can see that it deflects and then that uh, information gets projected down into the uh, vestibular pathways of the cranial nerve. And so when you first go into a rotation for movement, you can see that it again goes into the opposite direction for that flow of the endolymph, but then it starts to slow down and then it actually goes back. And so that's why you have that change in the visual function when you're moving towards the um, stimuli and then when you are reverting back, you have that little um, bounce back effect. And for the different orientations, you could see that for this piece, the horizontal plane is the horizontal plane. So it detects movement for um, horizontal axes. Whereas when you have more of that anterior and posterior, that's a, at a 45 degree angle, they all um, can sense that change for those angles and they actually activate within each other. They communicate directly with one another based on the uh, endolymph motion. And so when you have that change in pivot of your head, what happens is that the endolymph that we saw a little bit ago, um, with the, within the macule of the autoliths, they can pull and you can, it, it, those are actually, that liquid is actually heavier than um, the surrounding area. And so that's when you have that rotation, you have that pull and it stays down until you have that endolymph um, motion bounce back into the other direction. And so that's why you have that positional and it stays until you have that recovery. And what's also important to think about is about the direction of the different hair cells. And so here it's not really well um, shown, but all of those hair cells have multiple, multiple, multiple directions. And so that's why it's very, very sensitive to the different directions of the any head tilt. It stimulates some cells. And so that's why you'll have a unique pattern of that activity in um, the different fibers that innervate to the different um, areas of the um, ganglion. And so it's very, very specific. And so any type of 
difficulty throughout the process, it can result in feelings of vertigo and nystagmus and things of that nature, but we'll get into. And so being even more specific, the linear acceleration of the head tilt, you have more of the um, macula or the um, utricle for going forwards and backwards or side to side, whereas the saccule is more of like up and down. And then when we come into the semicircle canals, what we're seeing here, that's more looking at the angular acceleration. And so getting into the vestibular pathways, and we can see that there's a lot of different areas that are being affected. So there's four specific vestibular nuclei on each side of the brain stem. And so we see here that um, on each side, it, it communicates on different pathways and they also communicate with each other. So specifically with the lateral vestibule nucleus, it gives rise to the lateral vestibulospinal tract. And then that uh, also gives, uh, has some communication with the medial descending motor system. And that's why you have that communication with all these different um, cranial nerves uh, for overlap. And I'll get into the specific ones in, in just a bit. And then we also have um, the lateral vestibular spinal tract extends through the length of the spinal cord. It's important for maintaining balance as well as extensor tone and positional changes to compensate for the uh, head tilts and movements of the body. And then we also have the uh, medial vestibular nucleus, which is actually um, has additional contributions from the inferior vestibular nucleus, and it gives rise to the medial vestibular um, um, tract the medial vestibule spinal tract. And as you can see, there's a ton of terms to always uh, be able to pronounce on the fly. So apologize for the tongue tying. But as we can see here that um, it only, it, it actually extends um, to the uh, cervical spine. It's also important for controlling the neck and head position. And so for this here, for the medial longitudinal fasciculus, we can see it has connections to multiple areas, including the medial, as well as the superior vestibular nuclei, and those ascend to the ocular motor, trochlear, and abducent nuclei. And so importantly, this pathway mediates the uh, uh, vestibular motor ocular reflex. And this is important for adjusting for changes for head position, as well as for uh, numerous important reciprocal connections within the cerebellum. And I know last week was an excellent presentation. And this um, also goes hand in glove with many parts of the cerebellum, but most importantly, the connections mainly occur within the flocule nodule uh, lobes, as well as the cerebral, uh, cerebellum vermis. And this is, this is just to show how complicated and involved this system truly is. So we have the superior medial lateral inferior uh, vestibular uh, nuclei here, and it transcends, uh, it, I'm sorry, it, um, it, it transcends all of these different areas. So it has the uh, different flexor muscles. It has an impact on the different, um, flexor muscles at different areas for the lower spinal cord, the lumbar part of the spinal cord, and it, it, it goes up to the um, excitatory endings of the back muscles too. So just within that piece, you can see there's a ton of different involvement here, but importantly also for the ascending pathways, they rely on more of the ventral posterior uh, nucleus of the thalamus to reach all the way up to the uh, cerebral cortex, and when we're looking at this, it's more um, involved with um, positioning of the head for awareness and you know, being able to integrate visual and tactile spatial information in the parietal association cortex. So there's a ton of information that's being sent um, up to the brain, but also down towards the spinal column in order to control muscle movement and body orientation. And 
it, there's a lot of different areas of um, involvement within the brain, a lot within the thalamus, and I, I have some references and resources for more specifics about that. And looking at time, I'm going to speed up a little bit. This is just giving you um, a nice visual for that vestibular uh, ocular reflex. So here we can see the rotation of the semi-canals going up to the vestibular ganglion and innervating at the vestibular nuclei. And so for that green piece, it's looking more of the excitatory neurons and the and then for that red line, that's more of it inhibits that muscle. And so we could see that one is cut off, whereas these are projecting directly onto the cranial nerve three, as well at the as well as the um, cranial nerve six for the abducens. And so we could see that it has a direct impact on how vision is modulated as well at for um, directionality for eye tracking. So the trivia question, if you guess the temporal bone, you would be correct, but this is specific to the walls that are protecting that bony labyrinth, that bony tube that's protecting those semicircular canals. So for common presentations that you would see within the clinic, we're looking at um, tinnitus is one of the most rep reported difficulties. So this is a unwanted perception of sound that often occurs in the absence of external stimuli. This could be either objective, so both the assessor and the uh, and patient can uh, sense this or as it's subjective. So the objective piece is that it's audible to both and it's really typically due to uh, sound created by the flow of blood within the vessels or the contraction of a muscle within a nearby structure. And um, there's a lot of different uh, reasons that this can occur, whereas a subjective can only be heard by the patient and typically correlates with hearing loss. And so thinking about, you know, have older age, losing the sensitivity of the hair cells within the cochlea, and secondary to noise trauma, or as well as some medications that we'll get into. Unfortunately, this has a high comorbidity with psychiatric illness, specifically with depression, anxiety, and insomnia. There's several different treatments for tinnitus um, or tinnitus, and, and but the aim really is being able to mitigate the triggers. And so this, you know, there's different um, efficacy rates for depending on the etiology, but, you know, thinking about how depression impacts this presentation, it, you know, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy has limited efficacy, unfortunately, more of sound therapy. So masking the perception of the tinnitus and reducing the disturbance caused by the tinnitus is most efficacious. And so for nystagmus, so it's involuntary rapid rhythmic oscillation of the eyes. So I'll show a quick video of that. So you can see that rapid movement. So what's happening is that the brain is, think, is perceiving that it's moving and this fast rapid movement is trying to offset it and correct it. So that's more of the fast phase psychotic movement. And so with that, I can I can also show you, so I can also show you how it is when it's purposeful within a direction. Let's set that to. Combination. So Derek, if you don't mind, can you look at my finger here? So at rest once more, there's no evidence of ptosis no square wave jerks and the pupils are equal. So if I could get you to keep your head still, please, Derek, and look to your left. So he's got some nystagmus on lateral gaze there, as you can see, more marked in the left eye than the right, which is the big hint here as to whether there's an underlying right-sided INO looking to the left. But much more obviously, can you look now to your right? He's got very marked nystagmus in his right eye with the failure of adduction of the left eye. 
And so with this, um, the nystagmus can present for the uh, vertical, which we just saw, a horizontal, as well as rotary, so more of a circular. So for uh, peripheral vestibular disturbance, um, you tend to see the direction is just in one area, and it's most commonly horizontal, and it increases within the intensity with the gaze and the direction, which we just saw. And so there's a very quick uh, assessment for this. It's cows. So you uh, put the patient on the one side and you pull cold water in their ear, their eyes will go um, to the opposite side. But if you put warm water, it goes to the same side. Not the most fun task. I wouldn't recommend it, but you know, our colleagues in neurology, they have that ability to do that. But importantly, the vestibular and visual and somatosensory inputs are normally combined seamlessly to produce or a sense of orientation and movement. If um, one of those are negatively affected, typically the two can compensate for that, especially if um, there's a vestibular function, as long as the visual cues are available, humans can typically um, compensate very well for that. And for the peripheral vestibular presentation, there's several uh, different potential causes. Most commonly is the middle or inner ear infections. Vertigo, so this is the sensation of spinning movement that you cannot sit still. It feels like the room is spinning, but you can't control it. There's several causes for this. It could be both peripheral um, disorder of the inner ear. It could also be a central disorder but uh, of the brain stem or cerebellum, but that's less common. And for the assessment of that, there's a few different ways you can do it. For the orthostatic measure of blood pressure that's um, going from supine to sitting to standing, if you have the substantially greater um, elevation with uh, your pulse or heartbeat, or blood pressure, that would be indicative that it is not a uh, vestibular lesion within the central um, pathways. It would be more indicative of another process. And there's also um, a positioning test. And so the examiner would turn one head on ear is down and extends over the table and you have rapid head movements. And I did include a clip of that at the end as a reference so you can see that. But importantly, that one does assist with being able to differentiate between um, peripheral lesions versus central lesions. The peripheral, you have a, um, a delay of um, the vertigo symptoms, whereas the central, it's immediate. So benign. Um, Proximal position vertigo. This is one of the most common form of acute of peripheral vestibular dysfunction. It's most common with individuals who are female and those who are over the age of 50. So most common um, causes uh, it's a vertigo as well. And so with this, as we saw earlier, those calcification of those crystals of the otoliths that's what's causing the issue. So they'll tend to break off and push against that um, cupola. And so when you have that, it obstructs that flow. And so if when this occurs, it's actually easy to treat, which is really nice. So there's, um, you, you can do uh, adaption exercises as uh, well as uh, the repositioning maneuvers. And this can be done by physical therapy. Um, and typically individuals that um, present with this type of vertigo, they don't really know how to describe it well. So it's important to walk them through like positional difficulties, like when they go to lie down, do they experience it? And when they're trying to fall asleep, are they experiencing it more? The nearest disease, this is a really unfortunate uh, presentation. So it's uh, fluctuating symptoms of vertigo, nausea, hearing loss, or and tinnitus. Not all of these symptoms need to present, and it's typically due to the swelling of the uh, membrane, uh, membrous labyrinth that we saw in prior slides, and it's due to the endolymphatic swelling. And it's unfortunate because what happens is it has some a blockage, um, but that might not always be the case. Unfortunately, we're still not sure about 
all of the different potential underlying etiologies for the presentation of Meniere's disease. And so for treatment, it's really hit or miss. There's uh, what the physicians tend to do is prescribe um, a diet that restricts salt intake, uh, prescribing diuretics or surgery, which has a 50-50 split of um, benefits. And so the next one, and the, there's also autotoxicity due to medications that can negatively impact hearing as well. And so we see that there's over 200 known medications that can uh, affect this. And so serious infections, uh, medications are prescribed for that, cancer, heart disease. It can either be permanent or temporary. So that's why it's very, very important to inform patients that if they're experiencing any type of hearing loss or difficulties, that they need to speak to their provider about uh, different medications and its potential effects on these processes. And what happens is that these medications add energy to the vibration of that basal uh, membrane and it increases the amplitude. And unfortunately, the ossicles are not able to inhibit those because it's after that process. And so that's why you know it's really hard to treat. So concussion, and I'm gonna go through this quickly because I see we only have about nine minutes. And so for concussion, we're really talking about um, synonymous with mild TBI, depending on who you read but we're looking at um, no loss of consciousness to less of 30 minutes. So really, um, you know, just not anything to moderate to severe TBI. So with the concussion, cranial nerve involvement is minimal at best, um, unless you have an abrupt direct injury that to your face, which would impact olfactory nerves, potentially facial nerves and so on and so on. Hearing loss and tinnitus is actually pretty common, especially in individuals that who have sustained their concussion within a motor vehicle crash because of that angular change in um, on multiple planes because of that axis of rotation. It involves a lot of different linear uh, processes, and that's where you could see a labyrinth concussion is because that uh, membrane is a uh, labyrinth has been jolted and that endolymphatic fluid has been flowing around interacting with each other. So it expands and it's not just one specific area, it's all over. And so that's where it can uh, have a labyrinth concussion. And you can also see this in literature as a labyrinth migraine. And so I put this on here, the persistent post-concussive sim uh, symptoms um, you know, that can present for many, many months up to years for this vestibular as where well as auditory changes. And so with this, this is basically a slide of uh, different proposed profiles of concussion. You can see it's broken down to vestibular, ocular, migraine, anxiety, mood, fatigue, and cognition. But importantly, these are just proposed. There's a lot of different literature arguing about um, the split between the different profiles because we could see there's a lot of overlap between of symptoms of concussion between these different profiles. And what we could see also is that there um, the profiles can be uh, co-presenting. And there's about thirty percent of patients that uh, have a post-concussive uh, symptom disorder and uh, dizziness, unfortunately has worse outcomes for uh, thinking about um, recovery of symptoms. And for that, it's one of the higher risks for developing these post-concussive symptoms is having pre-existing uh, risk factors of personal or familial history of motion sickness for specifically for the vestibular presentation. And so there is an assessment that we as neuropsychologists uh, can do. It's called uh, the VOM. So it's Vestibular Ocular Motor Screening Tool. And it's looking at, uh, this is specifically for that subtype of concussion. And so you're looking at horizontal and vertical um, ocular reflexes, as well as the visual motion sensitivity and looking at ocular motor for those smooth pursuits, the horizontal and vertical saccades, and near conversion. 
And for this, I have a very short video just to show you how easily this can be done within the clinic. I'm not showing the entirety of it, just a cover from their concussion more quickly. The first exam that we're gonna do is smooth pursuits where we're observing the tracking motion of the athlete's eyes. So the athlete will stay focused on a target and keep their head still and follow the target with her eyes. You will ask if they have any symptoms as you go to their end range of motion of their eyes. Oftentimes, if they are concussed, they will have pressure or pain with that end range of motion. And so for each of these different steps, you're asking about their symptom presentation of dizziness, uh, nausea, vertigo, and uh, it's a list that's freely accessible, easy to do within the clinic. And importantly, this is not necessarily to be done as, you know, within a certain time span after the concussion, obviously, because these uh, different uh, presentations of vestibular and ocular symptoms can present uh, for months, even years, potentially after the concussion. And so quickly for a case example, uh, we have uh, Vanessa Carlisle, who's a 35-year-old right-handed uh, white Caucasian female with over 20 years of education. She had a past medical history of infrequent migraines, uh, benign and proximal positional vertigo on the left, um, major depressive disorder, and general anxiety disorder, and undiagnosed ADHD for which she was being prescribed Adderall. Um, she, all, she had a concussion, uncomplicated mild TBI, two years prior to the neuropsych uh, evaluation she, from a bicycle crash. She was helmeted, but she was um, ran over by an SUV and crushed her uh, helmet. That resulted in bilateral occipital um, condyle fractures and also a maxillary fracture. She denied uh, LOC, uh, loss of consciousness, uh, she had a, a post-traumatic amnesia for about 30 minutes, and she had altered state of consciousness for several hours. She currently works full time. She is enrolled in another doctoral program, and she also um, works at, in a scientific laboratory. So in full on going, full on within her life, no issues going on for those purposes. And so her neuroimaging demonstrated the thinning of arcuate eminence. So that's looking more left than right. And so that's looking where um, that cranial nerve eight is coming out within that area. And then also there was some concern for superior semicircular canal uh, adhesions. And so that's looking at potential separation of that uh, area. And so her cognitive complaints started approximately a year after her concussion for her cognitive symptoms. And that's when she was going full, um, re-enrolled to a new doctoral program because she already completed one. And uh, her cognitive symptoms worsened with um, extra effort being able to study and going into full-time academic work. So her physical symptoms included increased headaches, worsening of her benign um, proximal position vertigo, tinnitus, as well as inconsistent balance difficulties, blurred vision when she reads too long, and she had concern for orthostatic hypotension. So going back to what we were talking about earlier for being able to assess for uh, this being um, looking at if it could be contributory for a vestibular lesion, it was deemed not. And for emotional, she was becoming more depressed due to her physical limitations and exacerbation of her anxiety symptoms. And for behavioral observations, she reported to have blurred vision when um, she was looking at uh, visual mediated stimuli for longer periods of time. She presented to with impulsivity, not surprising due to her undiagnosed ADHD, variability in attention, and she did have some fatigue. So for the test results, she had a relative weakness on aspects of auditory attention and working memory, as well as processing speed. Surprise, surprise for an individual who has ADHD and coupling that with her uh, behavioral observations, her affect was uh, very depressed and she had PTSD. 
And so thinking about that presentation of the post-concussive symptoms, she has the overlapping um, profiles of that vestibular difficulties and ocular. And importantly, what on our neuropsych measures for that ocular uh, movement, we might not be picking that up because that um, correction that we see for that uh, visual ocular motor reflex is much faster than what we would be detecting for that visual speeded processing. And so that's why it's really important to do something like the VOMS if you're going to be detect, uh, picking that up. And so for recommendations, uh, referring her to being followed up by a neurology to further assist her with her vestibular dysfunction, have repeat neuroimaging to get that better understanding of those concerns that first cropped up and also uh, recommended her to go to physical therapy to assist with both uh, a formal vestibular ocular eval, but also treatment for those, um, uh, the proximal vertigo. Psychotherapy, of course, for these different presenting difficulties and um, consulting with her prescriber to uh, see if a non-stimulant medication for attentional difficulties would be more appropriate given her um, persistent levels of anxiety. And so I have resources. Ninja Nerd is an incredible resource. It's a MD who has a ton of videos for all the different uh, systems of the body, but a, a majority of them are, are at the brain. And I have these two links that you can get down into the nit and gritty details of the cranial nerves and also an exam of how to assess the cranial nerves. And I have a bunch of references as well for your reading pleasure. And with that, I will stop it there just at time. Thank you, Dr. Mullen. This is fabulous. Um, you packed in a ton of information in a very short period of time and I'm sure everyone is really grateful for that. And I am glad that you kind of chose to focus on these sensory pathways in particular, because I think um, a lot of people uh, would benefit from that. Sometimes we get a lot of other pathways and less focus on these, so this is excellent. Um, we have one question that came up um, and someone was wondering if sound therapy, uh, what what is involved with sound therapy for uh, the treatment of tinnitus or tinnitus? Yeah, right. Depending on who you talk to, tinnitus or tinnitus, right? Um, but for that, yeah, for sound therapy, basically, it's being able to establish a frequency that's very similar to that noise resonance for the tinnitus, and so being able to find that frequency and level, being able to match it to that and um, basically train the brain to cancel it out over time. And so there's uh, different um, strategies to do that. And there's uh, some great videos out there to do that for individuals on their own. Great. Um, I personally have not had a lot of patients do that, but I've heard of it before. And so um, have you had patients who have benefited from that? Actually, yes. Um, and most of them are younger. Um, because unfortunately within concussion, auditory changes are really, really under assessed. They're more looking at that ocular um, vestibular process, not that auditory process. And so that's why I get skipped a lot. It's like, oh yeah, tinnitus or tinnitus, you know, uh, what have you, it's fine, whatever. But it's really important to be able to connect them because of that overlap with the um, tinnitus with depression, anxiety, and things of that nature. And so that's why therapy is always important for this population as well. Got it. Um, I know we're a little over time. Do you have time for a couple more? I do. Perfect. So we have another question about um, if you're able to just generally speak to the kind of basic, basic paso pathophysiological mechanism of blast-induced hearing loss of like, how does that actually cause damage? Yes, and that's an excellent question. And so with that, that, all, that goes back to um, that rapid um, sound. So similar to that gunshot. And so with that blast injury, the ossicles do not have the ability to dampen that sound. So you get that immediate fast um, sound wave that is very high. 
And with that repeated exposure, all the, the hair cells become damaged over time, as well as, uh, and so when you think about the process going down within the cochlea, that higher frequency is the first one to go because that's the closest one to the oval window. And so when you have all of those repeated exposures of the blast, that's where you see the most damage within the cochlea. And unfortunately, you know, you can't anticipate when you're gonna have a blast within um, your ossicles. And so that's why you have that and um, subsequent concussive symptoms. Because with some kind of lower frequency things, you have the ability to kind of have those hairs kind of heal themselves and, and come back, right? And Right. And that's why we see that with um, aging, the normal aging process as well. So those hair cells for the higher frequency, like those are the first to go. They're the first ones on the cochlea, unfortunately. And so with that repeated exposure throughout our lifetime for um, higher volumes, that's where those cells, um, hair cells tend to die first. I always imagine a volcano where it explodes and then all the trees nearby get knocked over you know, simultaneously or like an avalanche, you know, that kind of thing. All right, um, uh, question here. Um, it's kind of adjacently related, but someone was wondering about any thoughts that you might have about uh, EMDR um, mechanisms for the treatment of trauma. I know this can be a, a it's a, a very complex topic. So yes, it is a very, very complex topic. I, I couldn't put that better myself. So with EMDR, there are two different methods of engagement. And so typically the ones that are most advertised are, you know, back and forth to induce uh, REM-like um, visual motor um, simulation. But there's also another one that is tactile in which you have um, different paddles that stimulate your hands at um, alternating rates. And so um, thinking about how that impacts PTSD um, for the efficacy of treatment, I mean, it's, it's variable, right? Um, and thinking about these different injuries for if there's any type of visual vestibular dysfunction, like with nystagmus, and if you could actually be tricky, tri triggering someone having to have symptoms, potentially, if they have nystagmus, if they have benign um, proximal vertigo. And so that's why it's really important um, to know the different avenues that you can pursue for an individual that does present with these different symptoms that you can have an alternate option other than the side to side um, movement. Sorry, but that was a really long answer. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, it's a very complex topic. And my understanding also is that one of the, if they look in kind of studies to break down what is the ingredient that might be most efficacious is still the prolonged exposure to uh, uh, information surrounding that trauma, which um, is also the most efficacious part of prolonged exposure therapies and other types of things. So there's some main ingredient that seems to be helpful for people and uh, that's what they're focused on. Yep, you were 100% um, correct. <laughs> And uh, I just wanted to personally comment, I, you know, I appreciated you touching on kind of the intersection between the physical and the cognitive and the emotional when it comes to concussion and post-concussive syndrome. And I know post-concussive syndrome is a very uh, controversial topic as well. And so I'm glad that you highlighted that there can be, um, you know, people have uh, histories that they bring into events with them, such as, you know, undiagnosed uh, developmental issues. Um, and that if there's a, an injury to, uh, you know, occipital nerve or, you know, there's headaches or pain or other types of things that those can be very distracting cognitively and, um, can cause a lot of issues. Um, and so yeah, absolutely. And then thinking about those otoliths or what they call it crystals within the inner ear. And so those can stay for years and, and until you get that therapy. And so when patients come in and they say they have these issues, don't just discount them because they have a pre-existing history of migraines, of nausea or what have you. It, you know, it can be something contributing to that as well on top of those pre-existing difficulties. Yeah, so I think uh, I, I'm glad that you highlighted for people to 
think about pulling those things apart and sending people to the appropriate specialist to get the physical things taken care of because what we know about the recovery, the cognitive recovery of concussion is not normal to be experiencing those types of things. And so we have to look for other mechanisms or involvement in litigation or other psychiatric issues that could be maintaining symptoms after time. Exactly. And with that case um, example, that's exactly what she reported. When she started to have more symptoms of the vestibular difficulties, headaches, that's when her cognitive difficulties worsened and were exacerbated. So looking at that pattern and that interaction effect. Yeah, because that's the exact opposite trajectory of the recovery from concussion. So that means automatically there's something else going on. So Yes. Fabulous. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much. We are so thrilled to um, have you. And um, next week, I hope everyone tunes in for our next lectures. We're getting close to the end of this series here. Um, but otherwise, have a good day. Thank you.